So far in these videos, I've been considering only implicit linear analysis. Linear means that the geometric behavior and the material behavior are both linear. In this video, I'm going to move on. It covers chapter three of the book and deals with different types of nonlinear analysis, either implicit or dynamic, where the material behavior or the geometry behavior is, um, has a nonlinear relationship. I also cover some dynamic methods, uh, such as explicit methods. And a last section is looking into eigenvalue analysis, which, which is actually a linear analysis problem. But this would be used for frequency and buckling analysis. And it's a very useful tool in finite element uh, codes. I shall go through this presentation in three parts. First of all, uh, nonlinear implicit analysis where a solution for a nonlinear system of finite element equations is solved using techniques like newton raphson Then I'll move on to dynamic transient analysis and briefly show some analysis methods like uh, explicit techniques and um, the basis of methods which are used for new marks uh, analysis. And then finally, I'll go through eigenvalue analysis. This is really a linear type of analysis problems, but it's, it's, it's very useful for buckling and frequency analysis. I'll also give a bit of a wrap up on some tutorials presented in the second part of the book on these topics that you might want to try. And also I'll give a, uh, a brief uh, discussion on some parts in, that are presented in chapter three that are rather glossed over in this presentation. Here are two examples of nonlinear behavior. Uh, first of all, there is a, um, a simple plate undergoing four point loading. So it's supported on two supports, which you can see here and here. There is a contact treatment between these and the plate. And then there are two loading supports shown here. If we, if we do a linear analysis of this problem, uh, we will have a linear relationship between the resistant loads, resistance loads at the supports, for example, and the deflection. So for example, if I applied a, a load of one kilonewton, I might get one millimeter deflection. And with a linear analysis, if I were to apply a load of 100 kilonewton, I would have a deflection of 100 millimeters. I think you can imagine that there becomes some point where the, the, the results are actually becoming nonsense. Um, and, and, and in these types of problems, we really need to move over and look at um, uh, using a nonlinear analysis. You can see here the linear relationship. And from about this point, when the deflection um, at the, at the mid-span is about 0 0.07 of the span in this particular case, then there becomes a deviation when we use a nonlinear analysis. In these nonlinear analyses, I've, uh, non analyses I've, I've used an explicit finite element code that, that treats this contact and these deformations very easily. You could use um, an implicit nonlinear analysis, which I will be going through. Uh, you could also treat a um, implicit dynamic analysis. I shall also be touching on that in this lecture. So there's different methods to obtain this particular nonlinear curve. And as I say, you need, you need to do a nonlinear analysis at some point for this geometry if um, if the de deformations become very large. I think you could imagine if, if you look around you at buildings, for example, all of these have very small deformations. So analyzing of buildings, you would use almost certainly a linear analysis code. But if you were to start analyzing something, say for example, a, a blade in a wind turbine, uh, 
Um, at low wind pressures, the blade would have only a small deflection. You could, you could use a linear analysis, but with high wind loading, the blades would be bending very considerably and you would have to move over to a geometric nonlinear analysis in order to properly represent the stresses and strains within the structure. The second example below uh, is also shown for linear and geometric nonlinear analysis. This example is actually uh, tutorial three in the second part of the book. So I, I do this analysis with FreeCAD and Calculex. You can see here the linear results. If we were to do a linear analysis, we would get a reasonable representat representation of this rotation of the joint with the loading. But everything would be linear. Uh, doubling the load would double the deformations. At some point, this rotation that occurs is not properly represented by the linear analysis and swapping over to a geometric nonlinear analysis would give you this kind of curve. This is a curve of um, resistance force or applied force against displacement at the, at the loading end here. This is the loading, this is the support. There would be considerable considerable difference between the um, geometric nonlinear results and the linear results. In particular, the stresses could quite easily differ by about 20% in this particular example. And that 20% would be very important if you were trying to do, for example, a prediction of failure of this joint. I have added another form of nonlinearity in this analysis in that the adhesive layer here is modeled as an elastoplastic material. So at some point, um, the yield stress of the material is reached, and then you start getting plasticity occurring. And once this starts to occur, then the structure becomes softer and you start to get this type of behavior occurring. So from about this point, we have some plasticity occurring. And again, you would need to use a, um, a geometric nonlinear analysis with an elastoplastic material law for this type of problem. This is an example I often show students. I think it quite well demonstrates this problem of geometric nonlinearity. This is a cantilever beam. It's um, supported at this end here with an applied load here. So again, with this sort of problem, if you, if you had, for example, a applied load one kilonewton giving one millimeter deflection, magnifying everything by a hundred with a hundred kilonewton would give you a hundred millimeters deflection. Um, and obviously, again, this, this, if you carried that to the extreme, this would, this would be basically wrong. For small deflections, the linear analysis is fine, but for large deflections, it starts to become inaccurate. And this is because of the strain relations that are used to build the B matrix in the linear analysis. These do not take account of the effect that a, a deformation in this direction has an effect on the strains that occur in the material in this direction. We will be going through this in a, in a, through this in a few moments with the um, introducing the green Lagrange strains, which have to be used for doing geometric nonlinear analysis. And you can see here, obviously, things are, are really gone wrong. Uh, the, the beam length should not be increasing. It should sort of, as it, as it deflects, it should have this sort of arch and that the beam should have a representation, something like this. And you can see if we do swap over to a geometric nonlinear analysis, then we start to get something much more sensible. This deflection now is properly represented in this direction. Also, you can see that as the elements have undergone large deformations, they start to become look rather 
unhealthy, whereas in this case they're, uh, they're well proportioned and behaving correctly in this region. Usually in, in these codes, um, and for example using Calculix, uh, to, to swap over from a linear analysis to a geometric nonlinear analysis, it's usually just activated by a simple keyword in the control cards, so-called control cards of the, uh, of the data set. This is a common sort of diagram to try and show some of the effects of nonlinearity in the loading of a very simple element. What's considered is a, a simple bar element here, fixed at this support, pin jointed. Uh, it can only move at this node in the vertical direction, and there's an increasing load P being applied, and displacement U from this point downwards. If you do, were to do a linear analysis of this problem, <clears throat> you would have this straight line relationship coming up here and would continue indefinitely. And obviously that doesn't properly represent the sort of behavior that would go on in this particular element or this particular system. If we load up at some particular point A, you will start to get a nonlinear behavior. I think you can imagine as you're, as you're approaching this point C, you end up with a instability where you will get some kind of a snap through as it moves through to this position. There are several stiff stiffness matrices uh, taking or being uh, represented, let's say, in, in this particular problem. You have the linear stiffness. There is also a secant stiffness being represented here, given by the linear stiffness and a geometric nonlinear stiffness. The linear stiffness is not a function of displacements. If you remember, it's a, it's a function of coordinates of the element in the B matrix. It might be a function of X and Y within the element, but it does not depend, depend upon displacements. So this is um, a constant. The geometric nonlinear stiffness matrix, however, which will be, I will be showing a little later, this stiffness does vary with displacements. So it's a function of displacements. In other words, it will be changing as we are continuing to load this particular system. There is a, a third stiffness matrix, so-called initial stress stiffness matrix. The, in this bar element, you will have membrane forces which will increase. These membrane forces uh, can be used to create, derive a stiffness matrix which depends only on the membrane force and certain geometric information on the element. At this particular point around here, I think you can imagine this, uh, these membrane forces becoming very large. And at some point here, the summation of the, of the linear stiffness, the geometric nonlinear stiffness, and this initial stress stiffness matrix increases to such a point that you have a straight line here, meaning the structure has zero stiffness and it will become unstable. So this stiffness is something that's added to the initial and the geometric nonlinear stiffness, giving the tangent stiffness at any particular point along this curve. And when it becomes zero, we have a, a point of instability. So there are three stiffnesses, and we will be looking um, in the next slides at derivations of these two stiffnesses. I won't be deriving them in detail, but I will try to give some uh, explanations of how we do obtain these. <laughs>
I'm just going to derive the green Lagrange strains here for a material. We will need these for both the nonlinear geometric nonlinear stiffness matrix KL and the initial stress stiffness matrix K sigma. In this diagram, if we look at a simple 1D material, perhaps a bar element, um, it's undeformed here. It undergoes an axial extension due to an axial load. And due to loading in the structure, it may also undergo a lateral displacement depicted here due to these lateral loads. This diagram here shows the extension due to these lateral displacements that may have occurred. And if we just consider two points here and here, a distance dx apart, the first is displaced a distance v, and the second is displaced a distance v plus dv dx times dx. So due to this lateral displacements, as shown, you get a, an extra extension denoted dx dash here. We can find this extension by simply using Pythagoras. So for example, it would be dx squared plus this distance, which is this term squared, all of this square rooted. So that is shown here. We can then expand this as a series expansion, gives us this expression here. And neglecting higher order terms, we can show basically that the extension that's gone on in the material due to this lateral displacements is this, this extra term here. So our strain for this fairly simple case in the axial direction is our usual displacement gradient u with respect to x plus this additional displacement gradient due to the lateral displacements that have occurred. If we now look at a complete 3D material uh, where we also have displacements in the u direction and in the w direction, then we would have that the complete strain, for example, in the x direction, the epsilon x, is du dx plus all three terms now. This is the one we've just shown, and there will be additional terms added, additional displacement gradients added. I've not shown it here, but this would be the green Lagrange strain for shear strain, x, in this case, xy. And you can obtain, in very much the same way, you can obtain these in-plane strains and these additional shear strains by, by similar considerations. So for example, epsilon y, uh, you would have a, a, a y here, this would be v, and here you would have y terms. This part we've already been using to compute our B matrix. I'm denoting it B0 here, just to differentiate with the uh, distinguish with the BL matrix. This matrix, as, as we've seen before, it just depends upon nodal coordinates of the element. It's not a function of displacements. So this is a, a linear strain displacement matrix. I've not derived it here, but this BL matrix, if this was constructed from, from these terms, you will find that it is a, um, a matrix that depends again upon nodal coordinates of the element, but it also depends upon the displacements that the element undergoes. So this makes the problem nonlinear because we do not know these 
displacements in advance. It depends upon the loading and how the loading changes. And so this BL matrix will also be changing during the analysis or during the loading. And this will require a nonlinear analysis, which I will be showing a little later on. As I say, I've not derived these, these BL matrix here. Please just accept it. Um, I have derived it in the book for some simple elements. You will also find it in other textbooks on uh, finite element analysis. Here we have the full green Lagrange strains for a 3D material. These are the usual in-plane displacement gradients causing in-plane strains. And these are the displacement gradients causing shear strains. Then we have these additional displacement gradient effects caused due, due to lateral displacement. In a finite element analysis, the, the, these displacement gradients will be used to compute the usual B matrix. And these will now be used to compute the large displacement B matrix, which depends on nodal coordinates and also on displacements. I should emphasize the, these, these strains are still for small strain analysis. It, it, they are not for handling large strains as would occur, for example, in the analysis of a, a, a polymer or a rubber material. If you want to handle those kinds of strains, then you have to move over and start looking at um, hyperelastic materials and strain depending on the concept of stretch tensors. So these are still for small strains, but these, um, these additional terms that have been added are really uh, most important for handling the rotation that can occur within a material. So again, these used for the B matrix, these are used for this nonlinear BL matrix. If we combine them together, we have this relationship for a B matrix comprising of both the um, linear and the nonlinear strain displacement matrices. This would be our secant stiffness for any given displacement. And of course, this is, um, this is nonlinear. We, we don't know the displacements at any particular time. So we have to come up with some kind of an iterative, iterative scheme to find these displacements so that we actually know for a given load what is the stiffness. And I'll be showing in a few slides the techniques to, um, to do iterative um, solution of this, of this stiffness and find uh, the correct displacements. If you multiply out this, um, this expression, you will end up with um, uh, a stiffness that can be represented by, by two terms. We it can be represented by, first of all, the usual linear stiffness, which is given here. And then we lump together all of the terms that involve a nonlinear strain displacement matrix. So we've got this term, this term, and this term. So this becomes, this becomes our large displacement stiffness matrix for an element. I hope it's clear here too. I, I'm, th these relationships hold for an element. Uh, you assemble the elements in the usual way to get the structure stiffness, which I'm, I'm using large K here. And also these integrals would usually be solved using numerical techniques such as uh, Gaussian integration if we were using an isoparametric formulation, which, which would be the most common uh, for this type of, uh, for most elements. I just want here to show you or give you some ideas how this initial stress stiffness matrix is computed and some of the features of, of this particular matrix. It's only suitable, only has a meaning really for, for beams, plates, shells, 
basically elements that can go out of plane deformations um, and, and under that deformation create in-plane membrane forces. It can also be applied to bars and 3D solid elements, but it doesn't really have any meaning for a 2D continuum element like a plane stress or a plane strain element. I'm using the four degree of freedom beam element to try and show these, uh, these features. I haven't covered this in the last video on element formulations. It is in the book, um, but I think it's not really important. We can, um, um, I can just state it here and I think uh, you, you'll uh, be able to um, accept the particular features of this stiffness matrix. Um, the deformation of the beam, it has a, an axial for this four degree of freedom beam, it has an axial deformation and it has a rotation at each node. So we're talking about four degrees of freedom for this particular version of the beam element. The, um, the displacements that take place in a small element under bending are shown in this diagram here, in this sub diagram here. There will be um, a usual extension due to the actual stretching or compression of the beam, but due to bending, we get an additional rotation effect. And there will be a strain in an element here um, or a displacement in the uh, line here, which will be y, which is the distance from the neutral axis here, times the rotation that's taking place in the beam. Basically, uh, the differentiation of this added to the membrane displacement gradient gives us this relationship here. Okay, we're having we're having du dx. Du dx here will be the the contribution to strain due to this rotation of this small element, and this is our usual in-plane strain or displacement gradient. Now, due to this um, displacement V, lateral displacement, there will be an additional stretching of the element. And that is given in the Lagrange, the green Lagrange definition of strains as this contribution here. So this then becomes our total strain. Now this part is used to derive the normal stiffness matrix of the element and this part is used to derive the initial stress stiffness matrix. I've given them down here. This is derived in the book and this is also derived in the book but uh, you, you can see here the, um, the, the features of each of these. This, this stiffness matrix, which relates axial force and rotation moment at the first node to displacement and rotation at the first node and the same for the second node, is, is, is a function of the inertia, the length, and of course the stiffness Young's modulus of the material. And we have this symmetry stiffness matrix here. <clears throat> this initial stress stiffness matrix is quite different. It does involve some properties of the beam. So we see the length appearing, but the main feature is that it involves the membrane force. Important to state here, it is the membrane force, the axial force that's important. So as this force changes, then so the stiffness changes. The length is presumably a constant, but the stiffness will be changing with the membrane force within the beam. I hope it's not too confusing in this diagram. Everything is drawn 
to have a uh, positive sign convention. So this, this P, the applied load, is drawn positively, even though we've created a, a bending within the beam. So the negative load will actually be the one that would create this uh, or a dangerous initial stress stiffness matrix. In fact, if you have a positive load, the effect would be that the beam becomes stiffer and less likely to bend under out of, under out of plane loading. And if you have a compressive load, it will become softer and more likely to deform out of plane. And essentially, if, if this stiffness plus this stiffness, when this value P reaches a critical load, if the addition of those two becomes zero in any one of these diagonals, then you have a critical situation and the beam is likely to buckle. So I hope, I hope that gives at least some feeling for how, these, um, or how this initial stress stiffness matrix is formulated and some of the features that it has. This is showing the Newton-Raphson method, which is the most common method used to solve a set of nonlinear finite element equations. There are two basic schemes. There's the modified Newton-Raphson method, shown here on the left, and the full Newton-Raphson method shown here on the right. I've drawn these diagrams just for a simple single degree of freedom system, just to highlight the main features. But in fact, you would be using these um, in a full system of equations. So for example, we wouldn't be talking about a single load here. This would be the load vector of the system. This would be the applied load vector of the system. And these would be the full um, assembled stiffness matrices, either for the linear K0 or for the large displacement KL. So the way it works, let's, let's imagine we've got a solution at some particular load PA here, where we have known displacement for this applied load. We now want to apply a increased load PB. This then is our load increment. And with the modified Newton Raphson method, Raphson method, we use the initial constant stiffness of the of the structure or the element in order to together with this applied load in order to work out a load sorry a displacement increment this is our displacement increment we add this to our known displacement to obtain an updated displacement now for this displacement the internal stress within the element will be this stiffness k0 plus kl where kl is computed using the new displacement so it will be this stiffness times this displacement this gives us our internal force. So it's, it's this value I've drawn here. This internal force will not balance the applied force. There will be a so-called out of balance force present, which is always termed by this quantity here. You then use this out of balance force together with the initial stiffness matrix that's stored. We've, we've kept this, we haven't updated it. And from this, we compute a updated displacement, or a displacement increment that's added to this displacement to obtain a new displacement. And essentially that, that process repeats. We can now compute the new secant stiffness we can get the internal 
force at this point, a new out of balance force, and use this to update um, to get a, a new updated displacement which is added to the displacement we had here. That is repeated until eventually you converge to some point here. For the full newton raphson method, exactly the same is done, except at each um, updated position, so here and here, we will compute a new tangent stiffness, and this tangent stiffness will be used in the updating process. So it would mean a case that it would be a case of computing the k0, the kL, and the k sigma matrices. Obviously, with this um, this full newton raphson scheme, the convergence will be much faster and should be more reliable. But it, it can be very expensive because you have to com compute and assemble new stiffness matrices. You also have to invert them. And um, that can be a very expensive process. So usually people will recommend using the modified newton raphson method. However, if you, as I say, if you have convergence problems at some stage, you could then update the stiffness, use the full newton raphson method. So there are different schemes within these finite element codes to update if convergence becomes difficult, or perhaps you could do perhaps four or five of these iterations, do an update, and then do another four or five iterations with the tangent stiffness matrix. The, um, the quantities given here at the bottom um, are used usually for the convergence process. So for example, this is the norm of residual forces. It is the sum of the squares of the values for all of the nodes divided by the sum of the um, load vector squares, each term within the load vector squared. And typically when this reaches 10 to the minus three, typical sort of value, then you would say that the problem has converged. Or you can use a norm of displacements. So the displacement increment would be something like this. You square all the terms in the displacement vector, divide it by the total displacement squared to get rid of all the effect of all the negatives that might be in here square root it. And again, when that reaches some value like 10 to the minus two or 10 to the minus three, you would say that you've got convergence. I hope it's all also clear here. This, this would be lo one load increment. Um, usually within a nonlinear problem, you will split this into a number of load increments. You would not try to go from a, the end of a linear analysis, for example, um, up to the final load within one jump, you would you would have trouble with the convergence. You will split it into a number of load increments. So I'll move on now to dynamic and transient analysis methods. This is a, a fairly brief uh, discussion on these techniques, but I hope it will give you some idea of uh, methods that are used. This slide shows the explicit finite element method. This is a technique that uh, became particularly um, popular in about the mid 1980s as supercomputers became available and things like uh, car crash simulation, metal stamping simulation, these kind of problems became feasible to be tackled. Previous to that, uh, the, t the technique was available but rather limited to uh, highly specialized impact type problems. The technique solves the dynamic equations of motion. Now, I've denoted it's a, it's a method that um, performs cycles, and I've denoted it n for each cycle here. But in fact, each cycle is represents one time step 
So this is also a time marching process. The dynamic equation of motion involves masses of the nodes, accelerations of the nodes. So this, this is inertia forces. This is a damping matrix and velocities. So these are damping forces. This is a stiffness matrix and displacements. So these are conventional internal forces. And these are external applied loads. It's best to explain this via a simple spring model. So we've got a spring, stiffness K. The mass of the spring is distributed into two nodal, two masses that are added to each of the nodes. So half the mass goes to one node, half the mass to the other node. That mass is denoted here. And we have an applied load. We can use central finite difference equations to compute acceleration, velocity, and forward displacement. So first of all, acceleration is the resultant force acting on the node divided by the mass. And this resultant force is the external applied force minus the internal force. I should have mentioned here, we, we always ignore damping or this type of damping, Rayleigh damping in, uh, in these types of problems. So we simply bring this over to this side, divide by the mass, and we've got this equation. This is Newton, Newton's second law of motion. We can then work out the velocity at m plus a half or time delta t plus a half is equal to known velocity plus this time step quantity times the acceleration we've just found. We can then get the displacement in a forward time interval. It's known displacement plus a time step times the velocity we've just computed. This displacement now becomes the displacement here. We will have a new uh, force, resultant force acting on the node, divided by the mass, so we get a new acceleration. And basically, this process just keeps repeating. The Time is always increased by whatever our time step here is. So we're doing a time, um, a, a time marching scheme until we reach some kind of an end time, at which point we would then stop the simulation. One of the disadvantages here of this uh, explicit scheme is that this time step has to be less than a certain critical value. And essentially, the time step is the time taken for a shock wave to move through the smallest element within the structure. So we look at the smallest element, use a particular formula to work out the time taken for the shock wave to move through here. And that has to be our time step that we use within this uh, scheme. If you do that, the great advantage is that you can then treat each node within a domain independently. So you then apply these equations at each node. You will get uh, displacements for all of the nodes. Those displacements for each element then give you um, strains within the element. You use your material law to get your stresses within the ele element. And those stresses are then used to work out new internal nodal forces, um, which, which in effect would be this term here. Regarding this time step, um, as I mentioned, it, is, it, it has to be less than a certain critical value. This is the so-called current criteria. There is an example in the book where I, I show the computation of this for a very simple element, a bar element. Um, but basically, uh, it is the length of the element divided by the 
speed of sound between the two nodes in the element, which is given the speed of sound C is the, given by this quantity here. So it's the Young's modulus divided by the density of the material. There is a flow chart here basically outlining those steps. I'll leave you to, to look through that. Obviously in a um, more complicated uh, finite element code and a typical explicit finite element problem, you'll have a lot of other things that might be considered. So for example, if you had rigid bodies within the structure, this would mean all of the nodes in that rigid body would have the same acceleration. And that, that, that acceleration would depend upon the, the mass of the rigid body area and the inertia properties of the rigid body. So instead of using this particular acceleration, all the nodes within that rigid body would, would have some other value. If you have boundary conditions, some point is fixed like this node here, then the acceleration of that node is set to zero and that will force the velocity and the displacement of that node also to be zero. In implicit codes we tend to, if we fix a node, it's the displacement of fix that's fixed. In an explicit code it would be the uh, acceleration that is fixed. If you have contact, that's something that's hand easily handled with an explicit algorithm, the contact is identified, so-called penalty forces are created, and these, you know, these penalty forces resist the penetration of the two bodies, and penalty forces are essentially added to the external forces here to resist penetration. They then modify the acceleration and try to stop the two bodies uh, going through each other. The great advantage of this scheme is that it's, it's very robust. It can handle very large deformations. It can handle very large uh, material nonlinearity. Um, it can handle contact very easily. So it really is the only way for handling certain problems like um, severe impact problems. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, car crash, metal stamping, these are the sorts of problems which uh, are, are really only possible to handle with an explicit code. Calculix, which I use in the tutorials in the second part of the book, does have, apparently it does have explicit capabilities, but I must admit I never really got that to work. So there is a tutorial I set up, tutorial 10, uh, which uses explicit integration. And basically I use a, um, a FreeCAD software, which is rather like MATLAB, sorry, FreeMAT is the name of the code. It's very similar to MATLAB, uh, same sort of coding options and plotting options. And I, um, I use this to program a simple spring element of, the, of this type. And, um, and, and it's quite a nice little exercise. It allows you to, to experiment with different types of loading, with damping, contact, and also to investigate different uh, critical time steps to have a look at these, these problems of stability and um, instability. There is, of course, much more that could be said regarding these explicit methods, but I, th I think that covers most of the basic features I would like to mention. This is another approach for handling dynamic problems. Uh, these, are, these, these can be explicit or implicit. So again, the dynamic equation of motion is used. In this case, um, it's specified at a particular time, which we're calling T. We can, in this particular scheme, include the damping matrix. So we've got our inertia forces, damping forces, internal forces and applied load. Uh, 
we can get derivatives for the displacements in terms well let me let me show it here for example the velocities at time t can be expressed in terms of future displacements previous displacements divided by this time step another way to express this is future displacements in this case at plus delta t previous displacements at t minus delta t and we divide by two times the time step so these, these are this is another representation for our velocities at time t similarly we can express um, velocities at plus delta t over 2 and minus de delta t over 2 in terms of these quantities of displacement these these are then used in this expression for acceleration so acceleration at time t could be um, t plus delta t over two velocities and velocities at t minus delta t over two you then feed this into here this into here and end up with this expression for accelerations in terms of future displacements current displacements and previous displacements you plug this expression into here this expression into here rearrange things and you end up with uh, an estimate for displacements at time t plus delta t in terms of this relationship which involves previous displacements and current displacements which are both known the problem here is that um, the stiffness matrix will be changing so this is a function of displacements it's unlikely that the loads or the masses are changing but it's possible they could be but usually this will be changing with displacements so you need to set up some kind of an iterative scheme in such a way that basically the change of these displacements reduces to zero as the as the analysis continues this um, this equation this governing equation here can be solved either explicitly if you use a very small time step which is below a certain critical value or you can solve it implicitly using Newmark methods or this Hilbert Hughes Taylor method in these cases you can use a much larger time step which is obviously an advantage for the solution however you can't use a very large time step or you'll, you'll have trouble with convergence now I'm not going to go through these methods here these two methods they are detailed in the book and you'll find them in other books and for sure on the web they are they are available in in calculix and I do have several examples that use these um, and I'll, I'll outline I'll, I will outline these at the end of the uh, of the lecture so I just want to wrap up this part of the lecture to make a bit of a comparison between this uh, implicit and the explicit method in an explicit method you are finding information at a future time simply from information you have at a current time 
We saw this in the explicit method. We, we knew what was happening at time delta t, and we would use these central finite difference equations to find out what happens at time t plus delta t. This only works with a very small time step. If you're using an implicit analysis, as we showed on the previous slide, you're trying to find out what is happening at the future time based on information you know at a current time and also some relationship or laws that you have about what should be happening at the future time. You usually try to formulate this in some way that is equal to zero. That, that means, for example, perhaps the, the iterative process in which you're trying to find displacements um, and, and the increment of displacements is basically reducing towards zero. This uh, table at the bottom uh, summarizes some of the differences between implicit and explicit. This is a table that we, we used to use when we were trying to explain to people the difference between an explicit code used for car crash and an, Im an implicit code that most people were, were used to at the time. So this is rather specific to car crash problems. Perhaps in other problems it might not be quite so valid. Um, regarding stability, the implicit method is unconditionally stable. So if you're doing a dynamic analysis, it means in principle you could use any time step. It's unconditionally stable. If you're doing an explicit analysis, you have to use these time steps that below, are below a certain critical value, which is based upon this current criteria. Typically, in a finite element explicit analysis, if you're using um, metal materials and you're, um, you're using typical element sizes of, let's say, five millimeters, a time step is about one microsecond. That means if you're analyzing a problem, which is a hundred milliseconds impact, that's a typical car crash, you would need to do 100,000 cycles. So it's just to give you some idea of the um, sort of computations that are needed in order to do an implicit, uh, to do an explicit analysis. If we look at robustness, um, the implicit method are, um, are quite they're not very stable very often for highly nonlinear problems. Convergence can become very difficult. You might have to use uh, small time steps or small load increments in order to get difficult problems to converge. In contrast, an explicit method is generally very good. It, it will converge. Um, well, it's not a convergence, but it will remain stable during um, highly nonlinear problems involving uh, very uh, large amounts of contact, for example. Computation costs. Implicit methods are usually very expensive. You've got to formulate a stiffness matrix. In large problems, this stiffness matrix can become very large. And inverting this stiffness matrix can become very expensive. In an explicit method, we do not form any stiffness matrices. Um, so it is computationally usually quite cheap. However, it will be very high if you are having to try and analyze something that has a very long duration. So I mentioned that a car crash simulation is typically 100 milliseconds, but if you were trying to model some other phenomena, which was um, taking place over a number of seconds, then the explicit method is probably not feasible. Memory costs. Implicit method is very high because of these uh, stiffness matrices that have to be assembled and stored and inverted. The explicit method does not require large memory because it's solved on a node by node basis. There is no stiffness matrix formulated. Implicit method is very good for static problems. 
um, for explicit analysis because of these dynamic effects in the dynamic equation of motions it's quite difficult to analyze static type problems you can only do this with very very um, slow loading and introducing damping and these are some of the things that um, I tackle in this tutorial uh, tutorial number 10 for the uh, single element example that I mentioned previously with dynamic problems implicit analysis has limited capabilities for nonlinearities, whereas an explicit analysis is very effective and the same can be said for for contact problems it's quite difficult in an implicit code to handle contact each time you have a new contact you really have to be thinking about reformulating the stiffness matrix because the the structure changes in an explicit method handling contact is very easy you just create the you generate them um, compute these contact forces which are added to the um, external forces uh, it's quite simple operations and um, very effective in an explicit code so i think that kind of sums up what i would like to say on an implicit and explicit dynamic methods i'll move on to uh, eigenvalue analysis in the next part of this lecture I'll move on now to eigenvalue analysis for buckling and frequency and conclude with a short uh, wrap up of this particular lecture. Some of the features of a buckling analysis are shown in these diagrams at the top. I should say the first, an eigenvalue analysis for buckling assumes the material behavior is linear. We do not consider this um, large displacement stiffness matrix we only assume we only consider the, um, the the normal linear stiffness matrix and we consider only the initial stress stiffness matrix which i explained earlier on um, and and this matrix uh, is based upon the initial geometry is not uh, updated in any way due to uh, deformations of the structure so we consider only a linear analysis um, if we had for example a, a simple strut loaded axially it will carry loads by um, in-plane forces and then at some point it will become unstable you have a so-called bifurcation point and at this point it can snap through and carry the load by bending behavior so this is this is the Euler buckling load classical Euler buckling load for this critical first mode which is shown here there are higher order modes which occur, occur at higher loads this for example is the second buckling mode for this Euler strut you can see the different mode that occurs now and if you look at the force displacement behavior here we have the first mode and it buckles like this here we have the second mode and it buckles like this for a Euler strut these would be unstable collapse modes it would not regain stability and uh, essentially it will carry less loads and deform um, with with less force However, if you're considering um, more complicated thin wall structure, some kind of a section, then different things can occur. Again, you have a linear behavior up to some buckling load. It can, once it bifurcates and buckles in bending, it could become unstable, rather like the previous examples I just showed. It's possible it could be neutral. In other words, it can, can, can continue to deform at the same force. However, the buckling mode may also be stable, uh, in which case it will continue to carry load, increasing load or increasing force in this mode. And then at some point, another bifurcation point may occur and then it will buckle into another mode. 
This new mode may also be unstable, stable or neutral. Um, and you may have a series of these before you eventually reach a completely unstable collapse mode. In a linear analysis, um, these bifurcation points are assumed to occur along this linear stiffness curve. I mentioned earlier that we have uh, the linear stiffness matrix and this initial stress stiffness matrix. This matrix contains the membrane forces in the structure. And if the summation of these two is equal to zero, then we have an instability. And we're looking for values of this which do cause that instability. So we can introduce this factor lambda, which are scaling factors, and we can present the buckling problem using this set of linear equations. These are our displacements. Now there's two solutions to this. Either we could have a set of solution, a set of displacement that, that caused the problem to be zero, but this, this would be a trivial solution. Instead, we, we look for values of lambda in the determinant that cause the determinant to be singular. If we multiply this out, here is our determinant now, involving terms from the linear stiffness and the initial stress stiffness matrix. And these are our values of lambda. There will be n values of lambda, n being the total number of degrees of freedom of your structure. There will be n values of lambda that cause buckling to occur. So we're looking for values of lambda that cause this singularity, and they will be values of lambda that cause the pivots in this diagonal to be zero. And this is typically uh, found, these, these values, these roots of this whole system are found using a technique of um, eigenvalue extraction. And usually the most common method used is, is, has been proposed by Lacoste. I've referenced it in the book. I'm using a, an example here taken from the book to try and try and show you how some of these um, operations are undertaken. Um, it's a simple hand calculation. It considers a simple beam supported at both ends as shown with an applied load P at one end, fully fixed at the other end. For this particular problem, we know that the critical buckling load given by Euler is, is shown here by this particular formula. I did give this stiffness matrix for this beam earlier on. Here, here it's slightly modified, but this is basically the stiffness matrix for this beam, assuming three degrees of freedom at each node. So in this case, um, u1, v1, theta1, this is u1, v1, theta1, these are our degrees of freedom at this node. At the opposite node, we have these three degrees of freedom. This then, the stiffness matrix, linear stiffness matrix. And here is our K sigma initial stress stiffness matrix for this particular element. It's been slightly expanded from what I showed earlier to account for um, this, this degree of freedom at each node. But this doesn't involve buckling, and so we only have zeros in here for these degrees of freedom. Because we have constraints, here it's constrained in this direction and this direction. So U1 and V1 have no meaning, and in this direction, V2 has no meaning, 
We can then cancel out these rows in the stiffness matrices and we're left with these two matrices for linear stiffness and for initial stress stiffness. We now feed those two stiffness matrices into this expression that I showed previously. We make some simplifications. We, we have to apply a load. This is necessary in order to work out what the membrane forces are within the initial stress stiffness matrix. So I'm applying a load of minus one. And we also make a simplification simply for the mathematics here that lambda is replaced by this factor. This expression coming from here leads to this expression here. Now we can determine the root of this, the first root at least, by working out the determinant. It is this value multiplied by this times this minus this times this. And after some simplifying, you end up with this expression here. You can now work out the value for this lambda bar, lambda bar being our simplified value, by solving this quadratic equation. And you'll, you'll find when you do this that the smallest root is lambda bar equal to 12. In other words, this lambda bar here is 12. Now our critical Euler buckling load for this particular element under this loading is pi squared EI over L squared. Pi squared is 9.87. We have determined a value of 12. So this, um, this simple analysis using a finite element approach has led to a fairly close representation of Euler buckling load. There's a 21% difference here. And I'm pretty sure this difference is due to the fact that we're only using one element. I have done an analysis of this part of this problem in one of the tutorials using very many more elements and had a much better agreement with this uh, classical Euler result. So I hope you managed to follow that. We have to apply some kind of loading to the structure. We can then find our K-sigma matrix. We have the K-0 matrix anyway. We're adding them together and we're trying to find a value of lambdas which cause this root, this, this, this root here to be zero, which is found here. And exactly the same sort of operations are, are carried out in a finite element analysis in which this Lancos method is used to try and extract the eigenvalues of this complete stiffness matrix or the determinant of this stiffness matrix matrix. We don't usually try and find all of the roots, by the way. We only try to find, usually, it's only the, the lowest ones that are of interest. It's, um, and these will be the buckling modes that are most likely to occur. Also, this eigenvalue that we find, the value in this case 12, the actual buckling load is this eigenvalue multiplied by the applied load. If I had, for example, used minus two in here, I would have got lambda bar equal to six. So that six times minus two is exactly the same as 12 times minus one. In other words, the, the value I apply here for this loading on the structure is not really too important. Um, at the end of the day, the buckling loads are the applied load you use 
multiplied by the eigenvalues that are determined. And they will always have the same values. We can continue the analysis of this simple problem to work out the deformation mode. So putting our stiffness matrix for this, um, for this element into this equation, we obtain this expression here, which simplifies to this shown here. Now there's an obvious problem that um, emerges that these two equations are identical. That means there are no, there is no unique solution for the deformations for this particular beam. This is a, um, a problem of, of linear eigenvalue analysis that you cannot determine the deformations for a particular eigenmode. However, what we can do is propose a deformation at one node, and then we can determine the other values. So for example, if we, if we propose that the rotation is plus one, according to this positive convention here, we feed in plus one here, we can obtain from this system of equations that u2 is equal to zero and theta2, the rotation at the other end, is minus one. So according to our positive sign convention, we'll have a one here indicating this rotation. We'll have a minus one in this direction indicating the rotation is, is like this at this node. So an eigenvalue analysis, an eigenmode analysis now, will give us only relative magnitudes of displacement and rotations. This means we cannot determine any stresses or strains in an eigenvalue analysis, linear eigenvalue analysis. For a uh, linear eigenvalue frequency analysis, we use the dynamic equation of motion, which is given here. In this case, we ignore damping. So we've simply got the mass and the accelerations plus the stiffness and the displacements. For the complete system, we have this equation here. We assume in a full structure that all of the nodes in the structure are moving harmonically. In other words, they're, they're oscillating in some way in which they're tied together. They can't just be oscillating independently. So we tie them together with this expression here. We force that each displacement of the node is related by the eigenmode. So these, these are, this eigenmode would be um, a vector of deformations, which are of, of relative deformations. And this would be the frequency of those oscillations. If we double differentiate this expression, we end up with this. Then feeding these two terms into this expression here and cancelling out the sine omega t, we end up with this expression here. Again, uh, there, is, there is a trivial solution that all of these displacements are zero, so this doesn't interest us. And what we, we are looking for is the roots of the determinant of this expression. So if we have a, um, a structure with n degrees of freedom, there will be n roots of this omega squared term. And the Lacoste method is used to determine these, to extract these from this determinant. For each root omega squared, we have the circular frequency given by this expression, this is the square root, and the ordinary frequency would be omega divided by two pi. So it's a rather similar approach. We're not, we're not usually interested in um, uh, all of the frequencies again. We, we would just extract a certain number. This can be done in uh, Calculix and other codes, for example. Uh, you can either say you're, you're interested in the, the lowest frequencies, or you can also specify a frequency range that you're interested in. 
And just to, to be clear, these frequencies represent critical natural frequencies of the structure where you get this harmonic motion occurring. There is a nice example. I'll show this um, in a moment. It uses a tuning fork. It's, uh, I think, tutorial number seven or eight in part two of the book. So these are some of the tutorials um, that I've prepared, worked through in the second part of the book that are relevant to the material I've presented in this particular lecture. The first one is uh, tutorial number three for the nonlinear analysis of a um, adhesive joint. It's a large deformation problem. It also includes uh, elastoplastic adhesive. The next one are tutorial seven and eight, which perform uh, eigenvalue frequency analysis and also buckling analysis. I use a tuning fork as one example, and I use a box section for buckling as another example. Tutorial number nine performs a transient dynamic thermal and mechanical analysis. In this case, it uses Newmark's method. And lastly, uh, tutorial number 10 involves this um, uh, single element, explicit finite element analysis. We program the, the element, the equations to, to analyze this element, and then it investigates uh, certain features like critical time step, damping, different types of loading, contact, it can also be pr programmed to have two elements so you can see some of these high frequency oscillations that do occur in some of these um, numerical techniques. Lastly, just to explain some of the methods, I have some of the techniques I've, I've rather jumped over. There's quite a nice little worked example which shows you how to work out the critical time step for a single bar element. I did present the theory for the implicit dynamic analysis method, transient analysis, but I didn't really go into the new mark and this HHT methods for solving these equations. In the book, I do go into this in, in more detail. I've also here rather neglected transient flow field analysis. It is described in the book. Um, so analyzing heat flow, transient heat flow or transient um, fluid flow through a material. Um, this, is, this is covered in more detail within the book in this chapter three. And lastly, um, although I, I did cover a little bit here, this, this example for the buckling, uh, this, this hands calculation example, there, there is more details given in the, in the book and other examples presented. So it's a rather long presentation, um, longer than I expected. I hope, I hope it was useful, gives you some ideas on how these uh, numerical, different numerical methods are used for nonlinear dynamic and um, eigenvalue analyses.